Hello there, welcome to Cool Talk. Today we're discussing Australia. And when we think of Australia, we probably think of exotic animals, the beaches, the outback, and the outback, the Aborigines, images of Sydney, and a seemingly laid back, cocky people that are always happy. Yet, Australia does have a disturbing history and a lot of unknown elements. Home to an estimated 25 million people, most of them live on the coastlands. There are 8,222 islands. Many are inhabited. Australia has six states and two territories. If you look at this map, you'll notice on the west coast, you have Western Australia. Uh, next to that, you have the Northern uh, Territory. Then you have the uh, Southern Australia, Queensland over there on the east, New South Wales, where it says uh, AC, the ACT, that's the Australian Capital Territories. You have Victoria. And way down south, that little island is Tasmania. It's a constitutional monarchy in the Commonwealth of Great Britain with Queen Elizabeth II and her representative Governor General David Hurley running things. We have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. The Governing General presides over the Parliament, while Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Ministers of State run the Executive. Australia was inhabited by the Aborigines for 65,000 years. The Europeans arrived little more than 200 years ago, and when they did, there were over 400 nations and over 200 languages. Evidence shows that Asians crossed land bridges or hopped from island to island on primitive vessels to populate the mainland. A burial ground by Lake Mungo was found by archaeologists. It had two bodies, one man and one woman. The man was in a sitting position. He was 50 years old when he died and 6 feet 5 inches tall. Unusually tall and unusually old for those times. They had been buried for over 40,000 years. The Aborigines had a more complex economic and political system than we think, with tribal heads, trade agreements among themselves, and later trade routes with Asian islands. The Europeans would later be baffled by the Aborigines not understanding the concept of private property. This was because for millenniums, they were nomads or semi-nomads who circled the same areas. They lived by hunting, fishing, and gathering. There was very little farming. Because they didn't settle for long in one spot, there was no real civilization, no written history, and sadly, even most of their oral history is gone. So unfortunately, we know next to nothing of their past. 65,000 years of unknown events. The regional groups include the Kuri, the Muri, the Nunga, the Morawar, the Palawa, and many more. Their religion was a respect, a veneration, but not a worship of the gods because they didn't believe that the gods intervened on earthly matters. They did show reverence to the land because they didn't own the land, they were part of it. When you see videos of Aborigines dancing and playing music, they aren't just jamming, they are telling a story. The same with their art, as abstract as it is to us, to them it is also saying something, symbolizing. A lot of these wavy, seemingly impenetrable aspects to their art is because of their belief in the power of dreams. And dream time, as they call it, consisted in the idea that ancestors visited you in your dreams. So you entered into trances with the hope for entering a realm of dreams and a sacred state for them. They painted their bodies with colors obtained from herbs, burnt branches, and leaves. Rock paintings often showed hunters and animal hunting. Music was played using instruments like the dig geradu, which is made from a hollow branch, a branch that had been hollowed out by ants, nature giving them the means to celebrate. The Aborigines would often participate in walkabouts. Sometimes it's a rite of passage to walk alone with nature, into nature, and live off the land for a period of time, sometimes lasting months. Now this isolation would also include dreamlike states, the dream time. The isolation enhanced survivor skills and reverence for the land. 
So they lived undisturbed until 1606, when from the Netherlands came a Dutch navigator, William Janzoon. He spotted the coast of Cape York Peninsula. The Dutch later charted the coastlines and named the land New Holland. And if you look at this little map where it says Terra Australis, that means unknown land, which, which the British would later call Australia. It would be the British who would colonize the mainland. And in 1688, a William Dampier of the United Kingdom landed. He charted the land and wrote about the people. Sadly, when he wrote about his findings, he described the Aborigines as subhuman monkeys, the most miserablest people he had ever seen. Worse, he said that the land was theirs for the taking. In 1770, James Cook sailed and mapped the east, and he named that area South Wales. He claimed the land for Great Britain. And no, he didn't consult the Aborigines about this. Now, the British, by this point, had lost their American colonies, and they decided to settle colonies in Australia. They also wanted to set up a penal colony, a place to send their prisoners. It is believed that there were about 700 Aus Aborigines in Australia when the Europeans arrived. And as the Europeans invaded the lands, they brought with them measles and smallpox. It was deadly. The Aborigines, looked upon as not fully human, were also victims of frontier violence, and the population decimated. The Captain Arthur Phillips arrived to establish the penal colony. He did this in the area that is today's Sydney, Australia. Now, Phillips knew that the convicts would one day be emancipated, so he asked for skilled tradesmen and administrators to settle a colony and build settlements. He was turned down, but he did help plant the seeds, and by 1792, the colonies were developing. I want to state that even though about 160,000 convicts were sent to Australia, in, over a period of 150 years, men and women, Australia was not settled only by convicts. Many free men uh, also came, and it wasn't a bunch of wild criminals running around. They built homes and towns were settled, eventually cities. A politician named William Wentworth always advocated for self-government. He explored the area of the Blue Mountains and found grazing land. It was a land inhabited by the Gundungurra people. The mountains were deemed impassable, which is great to discourage the convicts to escape in that direction. But one former convict named John Wilson did cross the mountains. He lived in the bush. He wrote accurate reports, which is great, but he made the mistake of abducting, kidnapping an Aboriginal woman for his own pleasure, a sex slave. He was caught by the Aborigines and killed. In 1850, gold was found, and as the gold rush commenced, the United Kingdom set laws and licenses to control the colonists, and of course to obtain the gold. Well, the colonists rebelled, but they lost in what was to be called the Eureka Rebellion. Yet even though the colonists lost, it was the beginning of a national identity, the Australian. The Aborigines, meanwhile, suffered horrible atrocities by the Europeans. Look at these pictures. Some committed appalling acts of violence against the, the natives, even beheading children and babies. There were resistors. One named Yagan from the Noongar people was a warrior. When he heard of a Noongar native being killed by a European, he in turn hunted down a random European and killed him. Now, you may say that, hey, he killed an innocent man. But in Noongar law, if somebody killed somebody from your tribe, you could kill somebody from that tribe. It doesn't matter who it was. That was Noongar law. At any rate, Yagan got men together and for a few short years, he raided European towns. He was eventually killed and beheaded. His head would be sent to Liverpool, Liverpool England, where it stayed in a pickle jar in a museum for over 100 years. It was finally buried in 1964 in England and later exhumed and repatriated to Australia and buried with traditional ceremony in 2010. Another resistor, Dundali, resisted the English for one decade using guerrilla war tactics. He was caught in 1855 and hung. 
Other resistors were Derimut and Mokari. They tried to mediate and bring peace, but they were unsuccessful. In 1869, an attempt was made by the colonists to assimilate and westernize the Aborigines. The Aboriginal Protection Act was written, and the idea was to instill British culture into the children. So, Aboriginal children were taken away and indoctrinated in British ways. This was relatively successful, since many of the children grew so accustomed to the British and the white man's ways that they never returned home. Several animals, like the goat and the pig, were brought over by the British to graze in Australia, but they overexerted the land and depleted the grasslands. A white Australia policy was established to forbid non-Europeans from immigrating to the lands, especially Asians. And as for land grabs and displacements, it still goes on today. A lot of the primitive areas and bushland in a little over a hundred years turned into settlements and then modern cities. This is Sydney, Australia in the year 1900, a little over a hundred years after the British began to colonize. In 1914, 416,000 Australians fought alongside the British in World War I, right there in the trenches. A plan was put into motion to control and block the waterways of the Turkish peninsula. And so, Allied troops gathered at the peninsula of Gallipoli. It was a disaster as the Ottoman Empire pushed the Allies out. And over a period of 11 months, 302,000 Allies died, along with 250,000 of the Ottoman Empire. In World War II, the Japanese wanted to isolate Australia from the Allies. It was called the Kokoda Track Campaign, and it was fierce. Disgusted with the atrocities that the Japanese committed on Australian prisoners of war, after the war, military trials were held against the Japanese for war crimes. Now, this Aborigine is named Nemar Luke. He's the head of a group called the Chulamar. Now, this group of men painted themselves red and tried to fight foreigners out of present-day Darwin in the Northern Territory. Now, Nemar Luke and his band fought against any white men and also the Japanese. He died of pneumonia. In 1970, the white Australia policy was rescinded and immigration was now encouraged. Today, 29% of Australian residents were born overseas. Almost 1 million from England, 594,000 from the rest of Europe, over 2 million from Asia, 189,000 from Africa, and 568,000 from New Zealand, and 108,000 from the United States. Australia is 52% Christian. There are small amounts of Islams and Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism, and interestingly, 30% of the people have no religion at all. As for the Aborigines, they still struggle, and they are largely dependent on the white Australians for assistance. Since hunting, gathering, and fishing grounds, as well as lands that were taken away for farming and grazing, is lost. Their dependency has been disastrous. As one Aborigines elder said, If a man does not have to work, if he does not have to grow crops or hunt or do something, he very quickly destroys himself. And so it's been. In Australia, alcoholism and drug abuse has been proportionately much higher among the Aborigines. They suffer an alarming number of respiratory ailments, mental health problems, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and kidney ailments. Now, many complain and feel they should get past this as a culture, but if you take a way of life away from a people over a 200-year period, you can't expect them to just bounce back. Now, add to that that after hundreds of centuries of eating meat, fish, and plants, they are not genetically inclined to the Western diets of sugar. The Aborigines population today is about 3% of the total of Australia, about 750,000 people. The Australians have made quite an impact on the entertainment business, especially with films like Walkabout. Now, even though Russell Crowe was born in New Zealand and Mel Gibson was born in New York, but spent many years in Australia, and I'm not including them on this list. Nevertheless, look at this impressive list of Australian entertainers.
Australia has over 80,000 military troops. They participated in the war against terror and in alliance with the United States fought in the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, the literacy rate in Australia is an impressive 99%. Now, when you get a chance, uh, rewind this video and go back to this area right over here. The Australians take great pride in trying to make the workplace a happy environment. Australians have one of the highest life expectancies in the world, 83.2 years, according to the World Health Organization. And we can say that Australians, one of their biggest contributions is their people. They're very, very happy, very cocky, very assured of themselves, and perhaps we could learn a lot from them. And besides being happy and seemingly laid back, Australians uh, enjoy a high level of political freedom and freedom of the press. They ranked even higher than the United States. So Australia has a lot going for it. But in my next video, we're going to go back to Europe because when the Napoleon era ended, Europe was in disarray. But until then, thanks for watching. This is Cool Talk. Comments below, or better yet, subscribe.